Welcome back to Conflicts of Interest. This is episode 485. I'm the host of the show, Kyle Anslone. As I'm sure you all imagine, today's show we will be covering the wars in Ukraine and Israel, so a lot of important stuff to discuss on today's show. Uh, be sure to share the show. It's hosted at the Libertarian Institute and on the blog at antiwar.com. If you're a regular listener, subscribe to the show somewhere. If you like the video version, it's up at YouTube, Rumble, and Odyssey. And if you just like the audio only, uh, you can find that anywhere you can listen to podcasts. This would be a good week to go ahead and subscribe because I should have a bonus episode for y'all this week uh, that will probably be out tomorrow. And with that, I'm going to get into the news today. First story up here, we're going to tackle the war in Ukraine first. There's not as much as we have on Israel. Uh, Ukraine receives $1.15 billion in direct budgetary aid from the United States. Ukraine on Wednesday received 1.15 billion tranche of direct budgetary aid from the U.S. that was distributed through the World Bank. The budgetary aid the U.S. has been providing Ukraine funds the government services and sal sal salaries, subsidizes small businesses, pays farmers, and provides other type of economic support. According to the Ukraine Finance Ministry, the country has received $10.9 billion in direct budgetary assistance from the U.S. since 20, uh, in 2023 alone. Since Russia invaded last year, the U.S. has provided $22.9 billion in budgetary aid. Earlier this month, the Wall Street Journal reported that the U.S. was running out of money to fund the Ukrainian government. The report said after the $1.15 billion tranche was distributed for the month of October, there would be nothing left. Congress is expected to authorize more aid to Ukraine soon, but there has been a long delay. It's not clear how Ukraine will be able to fund its government. The EU is providing significant economic assistance, but has the knowledge it cannot fill the gaps that would be left if U.S. aid had dried up. And so, you know, we could talk about the speaker stuff, uh, but I don't follow, you know, that part of politics quite so much. So I'm going to leave that out in once. Uh, you know, something kind of is clearly emerging from the Republican side, then it would be, I, I think, worth it to talk about it in a little bit more detail on the show. Uh, but for now, I'm just not sure who's going to be speaker and that's going to play uh, probably a very large role into what kind of Ukrainian aid gets passed. And also there's the possibility that uh, the Biden administration moves through with like, I imagine, $150 billion aid request bill that would cover the border, Israel, Taiwan and Ukraine, and that may pass as well, no matter who speaker is. So uh, those are kind of the two things I'm looking at right now uh, to end up uh, kind of funneling the way for us to end up passing more aid to Ukraine. Uh, not that Dave mentions it in this article, uh, but I think it's also worth uh, just noting here that, you know, we're, we're giving them billions of dollars of aid, and this is one of the most corrupt countries in Europe. Uh, recently, when she came to the U.S., Zelensky's wife spent, I think, a mil more than a million dollars in a single shopping trip in New York City. So, um, you, you know, these people are very, very wealthy. Some of these people are very, very wealthy. And, of course, there are a lot of Ukrainians who are suffering, uh, but that it, it doesn't mean that all that money or even, I don't know, a, a good amount of it, I, I would guess, you know, it's 70, 80 percent. Maybe, but that still leaves billions and billions of dollars to just be straight stolen. That that's supposed to be American taxpayer money. All right, next up here is this very interesting article. A uh, former Ukrainian official says counteroffensive is a disaster, and I wrote this for the Institute uh, yesterday. So, a former advisor to Ukrainian President Zelensky says the summer counteroffensive has failed, and. He went on to say that Kiev will never achieve its war aims of recapturing the Crimean Peninsula and restoring Ukraine's 1991 borders. In a post on at on Saturday, Olsky Aristrovic, a former advisor to the office of the president of Ukraine, said Kiev has made a number of mistakes during the summer counteroffensive. He continued explaining that Ukraine has gained no territory since the end of February and described the situation on the battlefield as a disaster. He noted that Ukraine wasted so many lives and resources and lost a strategic position in the world. He went on to argue that as Western officials have um, 
as Western officials have, that Ukraine has suffered a major defeat in Bakhmut, causing Kiev to lose the troops and equipment needed for the counteroffensive. He went on to write that this mistake created a second mistake. Uh, the former aide to Zelensky now believes that the president has compounded the error of Bakhmut by failing to establish more defensive lines. Throughout the summer, Ukrainian forces were sent to entrench Russian defensive positions in southern Ukraine. Kiev suffered heavy losses and morale dipped among the Ukrainian people. And we've seen the Washington Post cover this, and also we've seen the polling numbers dip for Ukrainian support of the war. In the Post... Uh, on ETS, uh, he, the aide blamed Zelensky. Uh, he said, the decision to redirect military efforts and build strategic scale defensive line and areas could not be made by the military leadership. This is above its level of responsibility, but only political. So that I'm assuming is him just straight putting this on Zelensky. He went on to blast Zelensky for making a series of mistakes, and he said that Kiev would be unable to reach its goals. Uh, this is a quote from his post on that. Behind the strategic mistakes in the field loom strategic mistakes in public administrations, foreign policy, and domestic policy corruption. The real prospect of reducing aid to Ukraine, tightening screws within the country, the destruction of relationships with its closest neighbors, all these are direct results of non-military decisions or the right political decisions not being made. And so what he's talking about there is, you know, the Warsaw, Poland was one of Ukraine's biggest supporters throughout this war. And then Zelensky went to the United Nations General Assembly and attacked Slovakia, Hungary and Poland uh, for not allowing enough Ukrainian grain into the country. And then Warsaw said, okay, we're not sending you any more weapons. Hungary said, we're giving you no more international support. And the people of Slovakia elected a party that uh, has pledged and has cut aid to Ukraine. So, uh, you know, these are major, major mistakes that Zelensky has made that uh, this aid is, former aid is pointing out. Uh, and now he continued in the post the Zelensky administration doesn't even want to tell the people the truth. There will be no borders in 1991, and there will be no Crimea in the near future, but there will be defense, blood, sweat, and tears. He assesses that the war has now entered a stalemate. However, Russian President Vladimir Putin says Moscow's forces are gaining territory. Our troops are improving their position in almost all of this area, which is quite vast, he said on Saturday. Um, and then he, uh, oh, and then, I want to note here just at the end of the article that apparently this aid, uh, former aid, has come under investigation for making comments that promote violence against women, but he has denied the allegations. It, it doesn't seem like a very serious crime for what people uh, in Ukraine are definitely getting away with committing, so th this seems to be political uh, going after this former aid to Zelensky. Now, one more article here on the war in Ukraine and the general tensions between NATO and Russia. Uh, so last week on October 7th, the Baltic connector pipeline was uh, damaged significantly. And so I wrote this up for the Institute yesterday. NATO vows determined response of Finland and Estonia pipeline damage was intentional. So the head of the North Atlantic Alliance says the bloc will have a united and determined response if another state intentionally damaged the Baltic connector pipeline. According to officials, an external force caused significant damage to the pipeline that will leave it out of service for months. On October uh, 8th, 7th or 8th, I, I got two different days when I was reading uh, different sources, the Baltic connector and a nearby data cable sustain significant damage. The pipeline can transfer natural gas between Finland and Estonia. Baltic connector is designed to carry gas in either direction. At the time of the incident, it was tra transferring gas from Finland to Estonia. The pipeline started operations in 2020. Helsinki and Tallinn, both members of NATO, launched an investigation into the damage. The Finnish Prime Minister said Helsinki believes an actor caused the link. Uh, they said the discovered damage could not have been caused by normal use of the pipeline or pressure fluctuations. The Estonian, Estonian Defense Minister said he saw photos that showed the damage was mechanical and human-made. 
Uh, that defense minister went on to say that there was no evidence that explosives were used and explained the damage must have been caused by some force that was not created by a diver or small underwater robot. The damage is more massive. On Wednesday, NATO Secretary General Jen Stoltenberg threatened the alliance would respond to any attack on the pipeline if the damage to the Baltic connector pipeline was proven to be an attack on NATO critical infrastructure. It will be met by a, uni a united and determined response from NATO. He continued, allies express strong solidarity with Estonia and Finland as they work to establish the FATs. NATO and allies are sharing information to support the effort. Uh, the Finnish foreign minister said no decision will be made on what action Helsinki will take until the investigation is completed. The damage to the Baltic connector pipeline caused energy prices to spike in Europe. Current and former Finnish officials have suggested that the damage was a result of Helsinki joining NATO, which would uh, go on to suggest that Russia was behind the attack. Uh, this is from Alex Stubb, who we have talked about on the show before, and he's a former Finnish prime minister and um, was somebody who really worked to, to get Finland, Helsinki, to join NATO. I myself initiated that particular Baltic connector pipeline together with the Estonian prime minister. We wanted to reduce our dependence on Russia, and we wanted to have direct connection. It, the connector is the natural target for whoever wants to break that link. We knew that when the war began in Ukraine, we knew if there would be hybrid and cyber intimidation. This is a part of it. An unnamed Finnish official told the BBC, frankly, we were expecting something like this sooner. While no current officials have directly accused Moscow of conducting the operation, several have suggested Moscow conducted uh, the operation to uh, divide Helsinki and Tallinn. President Vladimir Putin has denied any Russian involvement. Last year, the Nord Stream pipelines connecting Russia and Germany were destroyed by several explosions. While NATO initially claimed Moscow was behind the attack, a year later, Washington and Kiev have been deemed the most likely culprits. The North Atlantic Alliance recently conducted war games where submarines were tested that utilized AI to monitor underwater infrastructure. And so, of course, you know, the, the timing of this attack is somewhat interesting given its, you know, timing with the Nord Stream attack and also that it occurred almost right after these war games were completed within about a month where NATO was testing its capabilities to uh, monitor its underwater infrastructure with AI submarines. So no idea what happened here. Could it have been Russia? Possibly could it have been some kind of natural occurrence for all I know that that is possible. Although Finland and Estonia are saying that the damage is too su substantial for it to be um, a, 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 an, a, an accident or a natural occurrence of some kind, I guess in some kind of accident they're, they're not rolling out. And so we will see, I, you know, I just don't know enough about pipelines, how far into the ground it is. I'm sure are not into the ground on the seabed and things like that, I'm sure, are very important to determining uh, how this was caused and things like that. So if we get more information on this, I'll definitely talk about it, especially if it, uh, if it turns out that it was a state actor or there's allegations that a state actor were, were involved because that would certainly, uh, you know, change uh, the, the course of war that NATO and Russia are on. All right, so this is... Uh, the, the section on Israel now, and this is just some dark stuff to talk about. First up here, Dave DeCamp, Antiwar.com, October 15th. Israeli president said there are no innocent civilians in Gaza. The Israeli president, Isaac Herzog, said Friday that civilians in Gaza bear responsibility for the Hamas attack on southern Israel as Israeli bombs are killing scores of people in the besieged enclave. Uh, this is a quote from Herzog. It is... An entire nation out there that is responsible. It is not true this rhetoric about civilians not being aware, not involved. It is absolutely not true. He went on to claim that civilians in Gaza could have risen up. They could have fought against the evil regime which took over Gaza in a coup d'etat. Proponents of that collective punishment of Gaza often claim that civilians living in the enclave elected Hamas, but the last time Gazans participated in an election was 2006, and many of the enclave's 
current citizens were not voting age or even alive at the time, as about half of Gaza's 2.3 million residents are children. Hamas, Hamas's party won the 2006 elections, but a government was not formed based on the results. After the election, fighting broke out between Hamas and the rival Fatah party, which was encouraged and backed by the George W. Bush administration. The fighting led Hamas to taking power as the de facto government governing body in Gaza in 2007. The Hamas takeover was used to justify the Israeli blockade on Gaza that started in 2007 and is in fact Today, giving Israel the power to compose a complete siege on the enclave in the wake of the October 7th Hamas attack on southern Israel. And so uh, another important thing to note here, and this has really been a part of, not I mean, the Israeli government doctrine, but uh, really what, uh, you know, President Netanyahu or Prime Minister Netanyahu has pushed in Israel. And this is supporting and making sure that Hamas stays uh, the the ruling party in Gaza. Now, this might sound backwards to a lot of people, so I'm going to explain it. And we've been writing a lot of articles at antiwar.com. Uh, there's a really good one at The Intercept. I'm not sure if we have ran this yet, but we I'm sure we will this week. Uh, it's by Alice Speary at Alice Speary at The Intercept. And she goes through and explains this all in very good detail. But Uh, you know, just kind of a little bit simplified for this show. Netanyahu believes that having Hamas in power in Gaza is really important because this is, you know, one of the kind of lumps of Palestinian people. You have uh, the West Bank and Gaza is where, you know, most of the Palestinians live. You have Palestinians that live in Israel too. uh, But, you, you know, this is like a group. So you have, you know, the Palestinian Authority and Mohammed Abbas, who represent the the Palestinians in the West Bank? I guess the the Palestinians of Israel do have some uh, members of the Knesset that they elect, and maybe that's you know more or less their representation. Although you know they're always marginalized and never have power. And then Gaza, it's Hamas. Now Hamas being kind of one of these two or three political ish entities of the the Palestinian people means that. As long as they're in power, Netanyahu can always point to Hamas and say we can't negotiate with Hamas. And so propping up Hamas, allowing, uh, you know, Hamas to have enough aid and money to continue to operate has actually been the policy of the Israeli government this whole time. And it's order to make sure that Israel is never pressured into negotiations with the Palestinians, how can you negotiate with a terrorist group is what they're going to say. And additionally, the the fact that Hamas is not only a political entity, but also a militia means that uh, they occasionally carry out attacks on Israel, which allows Israel to engage in one of the policies they really like for Gaza, which they call mowing the grass every few months or a year. They like to carry out a pretty significant bombing campaign of the besieged area in order to, uh, you know, just make sure those people are sufficiently placated and put down. So anyways, uh, Herzog's comments are, and I don't like to, and I really try to avoid using genocide on this show. I think it's over, it's an overused word and you know, it means a very specific thing. And a lot of times people claim, oh, genocide here, genocide there. Now, saying that every single one of two million people that you're bombing are guilty of something that they aren't guilty of uh, suggests at least, you know, this is laying the groundwork rhetorically for genocide of of Gaza. Uh, At best, I guess, you know, maybe you could look at it as an ethnic cleansing campaign where they really don't want to kill all the the Palestinian people. They just want them gone. Although the, the current bombing campaign looks, you know, far more genocidal than uh, you know, aimed at ethnic cleansing. So let's start here. Uh, State Department memo tells diplomats no Gaza de-escalation talk. And this, the American response to this has been astounding. So obviously Israel is a very core ally or partner of the United States. And even, you know, if I don't support that, it's no surprise that after this attack happened, the U.S. is delivering 
Israel military aid, that they're voicing support for the Israeli military, that they're condemning the attack and have, uh, you know, nothing to say about the Palestinian people so far. Uh, but, you know, you would I, I guess I would expect the U.S. to be urging calm to try to work towards a diplomatic resolution to this and to, um, you, you know, at least in some even token way mentioned the innocent Palestinian civilians, but the U S is doing the opposite of that. And honestly, I can't imagine the U S policy being more extreme here. If Trump was president over Biden, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable, appalling. So this again, Dave DeCamp, the state department has warned its diplomats not to call for de-escalation or end to violence in the Israeli airstrikes, relentlessly hitting Gaza, killing hundreds of children, By the way, as of Monday morning, the death toll is just under 3,000 and the death toll for children is just over 1,000. So think about this. Um, uh, About half of the people in Gaza are children and about a third of the people being killed in airstrikes are children. I mean, that would really suggest there's not very much... uh, careful or, you know, targeting going on in Tel Aviv that is trying to avoid killing children. And in fact, there's been, uh, you know, at the end of last week, Israel demanded that all the people, the 1.1 million people in the northern half of the Gaza Strip evacuate to the southern half. Now, there was a convoy carrying, I think, about 30 children, 70 people total uh, moving out of northern Israel. Uh, Gaza into the south as as Israel directed and that convoy was hit with an airstrike and killed about 30 children Uh, so we have things like that that are pretty just obvious that Israel isn't even bothering trying to avoid killing children in Gaza but you know further we've had Israeli military officials just come out and say the goal here isn't accuracy it's damage right they're not even trying to pretend that this is about taking out Hamas or anything this is about Wiping out the Palestinian people living in Gaza it is about as nearly a, it, it, you know, as you could describe uh, the Israeli policy here that is being 100 percent backed and endorsed by the United States. I I don't know if I've you know, it, I guess it's hard for me because I was so young at the time to look back at what the U.S. was doing in the days after 9-11, in the early days of the Iraq war and the Afghan war and all the people that, that we killed during those bombing campaigns. But to just sit here and see, you know, my government that's supposed to be the the people that represent me endorsing a genocide is, I I mean, I'm just so disgusted and I absolutely, you know, hate it right now because you don't want to be a part of that. Uh, You know, it's my tax dollars that are going to end up going uh, to providing the weapons to Israel. And, you know, it's the fact that America is the world empire that allows Israel to get away with what it's doing here. So when asked about calls for a ceasefire made by some progressive Democrats, the White House press secretary said, we believe they are wrong. We believe they are repugnant and we believe they are disgraceful. So, again, calls for a ceasefire, right? <laughs> like You're just asking, like, please, can we have an end to the violence for even a few days to get the civilians out? They have no water. They have no fuel. They have no internet. They have no connectivity to the outside world at all. They have nothing at all they need to survive. Israel is destroying neighborhoods, entire neighborhoods at a, at a time. So there's nowhere for these people to live. So let's give them a chance. To, to get some aid, to get some security, to move where the Israeli government is asking them to move so the, the they're not bombing convoys of people fleeing as they're instructed to flee. And the White House views that as repugnant and disgraceful. I, you know, the, I have little words to add to that. It just, it's as absolutely disgusting as, it, as, as they say it is. All right. So this is from our uh, Secretary of State, our top diplomat, Antony Blinken. As long as America exists, it will support Israel, (laughs) which, 
you know, just this is the way American officials are thinking right now, right? That Israel is a more important state than the United States, right? He's saying that as long as America exists, it will support Israel. So he's like saying Israel's gonna last longer than America. This is insane for a top American diplomat to be saying. So Secretary of State Antony Blinken declared in Tel Aviv on Thursday that as long as America exists, it will support Israel, a pledge that came amid relentless Israeli bombardment in Gaza. The message that I bring to Israel is this. You may be strong enough on your own to defend yourself, but as long as America exists, you will never, ever have to. You will always, we will always be there by your side. And again, think of how disgusting this is. We don't actually have to help Israel any more than we already have commit this ruthless bombing campaign against the Gazan people. But Antony Blinken is just so excited to sign the Americans up to prove how much we love Israel that he's committing us to doing it anyways. So since Hamas launched an unprecedented attack on southern Israel on October 7th, the U.S. has shipped more military equipment to Israel, deployed an aircraft carrier strike group to the region, and augmented its fighter jets in the region. Congress is poised to authorize military aid on top of the 3.8 in 3.8 billion in military aid that Israel receives each year. We are delivering on our word, supplying ammunition, interceptors to replenish Israel's Iron Dome, alongside other defense material. The first shipment of U.S. military support have already arrived in Israel, and more is on its way. As Israel's defense never needs evolve, we will work with Congress to make sure they are met. And I can tell you there is overwhelming, overwhelming bipartisan support in our Congress for Israeli security, he added. Blinken said it is important to take every possible precaution to avoid civil harming civilians, but did not mention the hundreds, now thousands, of children who have been killed by the Israeli onslaught in Gaza. And so this is, uh, you know, this is important to mention here because Blinken is essentially lying. I'm sure he knows <laughs> that, that Israel is not even bothering to attempt to avoid killing children. And yet he's sitting there saying that, you know, we're we're supporting Israel and we know that uh, it's important to take every possible precaution to avoid, avoid uh, harming civilians. But he's just saying that to make it sound like the Israel is avoiding harming civilians when he knows they're not at all. And uh, this is a pretty good indication that they don't care if civilians are harmed. U.S. won't draw red lines on Israeli use of white phosphorus. So this is National Security Advisor Jade Sullivan on Sunday said the U.S. would not draw any red lines over Israel's use of white phosphorus munition, a chemicals weapon that could cause severe burns. And so white phosphorus is this... Um, I think it's mostly ground launch. It's a flare looking thing. It, it goes up in the sky and it comes down and burns. Now, this is banned under international law. And, you know, I'm not sure if the U.S. is a party to that convention or treaty or not. Uh, but white phosphorus is supposed to be banned in use of populated areas. So if, you know, you're out in the middle of the desert in the middle of the night and you're looking to carry out operations, white phosphorus can be a useful tool to be able to see in the dark. Now, um, but if you're launching it over populated areas, it's likely to cause fires and chemical burns that kill civilians. And so... Um, the, the U.S. is Israel is using it over Gaza and Lebanon and Gaza is one of the most popular pop, populated areas in the world. And uh, so that should be a war crime. But um, Sullivan said, I have not seen I have seen the reports of that the IDF has actually come out and said they were not using phosphorus bombs. I'm not going to sit here and draw red line Sullivan said I was asked this same question in the White House podium a few days ago you know it's my job in public to draw red lines so whether oh it's not my job in public to draw red lines but you know if he's been asked this a couple times now then the White House could have gone behind it and talked about this 
Uh, Human Rights Watch said the use of white phosphorus in densely populated areas of Gaza violates the requirement under international humanitarian law to take all feasible precautions to avoid civilian injury and loss of life. And so, you know, this is an amazing situation where we have top American human rights organizations, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, coming out and, and pointing out that, you know, Israel is targeting civilians and they're committing war crimes like using white phosphorus over civilians. And the, the White House is just completely ignoring any kind of, you know, critical statement at all of what Israel is doing and just pretending like they, they've only killed 3,000 members of Gaza, not probably 3,000 civilians, including 1,000 children. All right, next up here, Israel says no humanitarian aid into Gaza until captives release. Now, this was last week, uh, and I think this story has maybe updated a little bit. So there were reports last night, this would have been Sunday night, that some kind of maybe minor ceasefire had been reached and Egypt would be allowed allowed to allow aid convoys to cross from Egypt into Gaza. Now, even though Egypt does have this border crossing, Israel has threatened to bomb the, the trucks coming through that, that border crossing. And so Egypt is only going to take that step in coordination with Israel. And Israel is currently saying that they cannot inspect those trucks so they cannot come into Gaza. Now, there are also some reports that Israel is either planning to or already has restored water access to Gaza. However, it's important to note that in Gaza, uh, most people don't drink water from taps in their homes. They have to go uh, get water from pumps somewhere and then, uh, you know, bring that water to their homes. And so even if, uh, you know, that, that water is turned back on, if there's no fuel, then there's no fuel to run the pumps and there's still no water. And also the destruction uh, by the Israeli bombing of the water system likely is going to prevent at least some people from being able to, to access water as they would before. And so even if these services do start to get turned back on, uh, it may be a little bit more kind of propaganda from the Israeli angle than actually trying to... to relieve the suffering of the people in Gaza. I mean, we've had Israel demand that uh, the, the Palestinians evacuate hospitals uh, and, and threaten to bomb hospitals. Hospitals have been hit. Medical facilities have been hit and destroyed um, during these um during during these uh, uh, Israeli attacks on Gaza. And so there's just absolutely no interest in or even intentional, right? Like Israel is targeting the, these systems because they don't want the people of Gaza to be able to live in the Gaza Strip anymore. They want them dead or gone. And so if you bomb the hospitals, the schools, destroy the water works, the sewage, everybody's home, then people don't have anything to return back to. Uh, you know, the, the Gaza uh, health, or the Palestinian Health Authority, I think, is already estimating that there are probably a thousand people still trapped under the rubble and are not trapped under, killed and, and dead under the rubble uh, from the Israeli airstrikes that, that they still have to dig out. And so, you know, the, not only is there not going to be anything to go back to, uh, Gaza is going to be an absolute just graveyard. I, I mean, this is, you know, the destruction may not be quite as severe or maybe a little bit more severe as Mosul uh, in Iraq because Gaza was in a, a far worse off condition to start uh, than when ISIS took over Mosul and then the U.S. Uh, bombed, just bombed and bombed and bombed that city to, to take it back from ISIS. Uh, but even then, years after that conflict, uh, there were still, I'm sure by that point, skeletons littering uh, all the destroyed buildings in the city. Uh, they said, you know, there, there's scorpions and rattlesnakes in there, and it's just the, the worst kind of situation uh, that you could imagine, a place where nobody can absolutely live anymore. That was once a, a you know, decent city, a thriving city, Mosul. And now, uh, you know, it's absolute rubble. And I think Israel is looking to uh, basically it's at a, a worse punishment on Gaza here. Now, there's been reports for a few days that Israel is planning a ground invasion of Gaza 
the Israeli military says is information and they are expected to, uh, I believe, clear the areas of Gaza, at least north of the Gaza city, Gaza city, which is, I don't know, north central in the, the Gaza Strip. And so this is a huge area of Gaza that Israel plans to launch an ground invasion on. Uh, we will see if it happens. I guess there's still some questions around that. There were reports that basically the, the uh, invasion would already be underway, but it's been held up due to uh, rain in the area and basically just weather. So uh, we will we will see, I, I guess, if the ground invasion is to happen, I would expect that it happens this week. Maybe Israel just decides to drop ground, uh, drop airstrikes on... Gaza just time and time again, and that is uh, its plan, but I I'm really not sure here. Uh, I do think that this ground invasion is going to happen. Now, it'll be interesting to see what happens if Israel does invade on the ground and uh, how, how many casualties uh, the Israeli military faces and how much resistance that, you know, is still left in Gaza when they invade. Uh, the U.S. is to plan to deploy a second aircraft carrier strike group to support Israel. So we already have one in the region, and now we're sending the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower. This kind of it worries me uh, about the idea of this sparking a wider war in the region. Obviously, Israel doesn't need the help if they're just bombing and destroying Gaza. Uh, maybe other than weapon shipments from the U.S., they really don't need, I would imagine, the support of U.S. aircraft carriers, uh, especially two of them, to continue to conduct that operation. However, if Israel goes ahead with the ground invasion and a group like Hezbollah follows through on its pledge to uh, attack Israel if it invades on the ground, or if, uh, let's say... Other militant uh, Arab groups in the Middle East say, you know, some of the former PMF forces, popular mobilization forces in Iraq, some of the Shia militias in Syria uh, decide to enact revenge for what Israel is doing to Gaza on the thousands of American troops in the Middle East. Then maybe the you know U.S. aircraft carriers would come into play. And I imagine that has to be what uh, the U.S. is thinking about when they're deploying these ships to the region. Now, one very interesting thing here I want to mention, poll, majority of Israelis blame government for Hamas attack. A new poll found that the vast majority of Israelis say the Hamas attack on southern Israel was caused by a failure in the government of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, and a smaller majority want uh, a similar but smaller majority want Netanyahu to resign once the conflict is over. So 86% of people asked, including 79% of the supporters of Netanyahu's governing coalition, said the surprise attack on Gaza was a failure of the country's leadership. A poll found that 56% of respondents want Netanyahu to resign at the end of the conflict, and 52% also want the resignation of the defense minister. And so... One thing I guess worth mentioning here is that the Israelis seem a little bit more critical of Netanyahu than the Americans. And also, it just kind of interesting, you know, post 9 11 in the U.S., if you look at how that really helped George Bush's polling and made him a more popular president, where this, at least the Israelis seem to care and be more upset about, you know, their government failing. And then Yahoo's long term plan, uh, you know, to help to, you know, kind of prop up Hamas has, uh, you know, maybe finally going to cost him his administration. Now, the other concern here, of course, is Netanyahu sees these polling numbers too. Netanyahu, not only his, you know, political survival depends on him remaining in office, but also potentially him staying out of jail and his wife staying out of jail depends on him remaining in office. And so, I wouldn't be surprised if Netanyahu wants to drag out this war as long as possible in hopes of changing the status quo in Israel to some situation where he could remain in power after this war ends. So just a couple stories to wrap up here that 
deal more with Iran than the actual situation in, in Gaza. Iran says it won't enter war with Israel unless Israel attacks first. Amid concerns about Israel's onslaught in Gaza escalating into a regional war, the Iranian mission to the UN said Sunday that it would only enter fighting if Israel attacked Iran. Uh, the, the mission said Iran's armed forces will not engage, provided that the Israeli apartheid does not dare attack Iran, its interests, and its nationals. The resistance can front can defend itself. And the resistance front would, you know, refer to Hezbollah, the Syrian uh, Shia militias and the Iraqi Shia militias, the, the PMF forces. Also on Sunday, the Iranian foreign minister, Hossein Amir Abdullian, warned Israel that a ground invasion of Gaza could spark a regional war with resistance factions referring to Hezbollah and Shia militias that operate in Iraq and Syria. And so this is, I guess, a little bit more interesting. You do wonder what would happen, say, if Hezbollah starts attacking northern Israel and the U.S. responds by attacking Lebanon. Would at that point it drive Iran to enter the war? I think we could be looking at a very dangerous, very large Middle East wide war breaking somewhat soon in and a part of that is because there are so many american officials that are just rapidly anti-iran and trying to blame iran for this even though all the reporting suggests that iran had no idea of this either um and so we have this uh, uh from dave de camp connor talked uh, about this a little bit on the show on uh friday but it looks like new york or not new york um the U.S., Washington, is going to work with Qatar to shut off the $6 billion in, Ar in Iran's own funds that were recently made available to Iran. Initially, those funds were in South Korea. I guess now uh, Qatar is kind of the guarantor over that money, and they're going to allow Tehran to purchase humanitarian items with that money. Now, this being frozen, I think, is going to cause not only a major problem in the short term between the U.S. and Iran, I'm, I'm, she'll kill a nuclear deal or anything like that, but this may be the kind of the last time there's any real effort of diplomacy between Iran and, and maybe any U.S. administration for the foreseeable future. Uh, you know, we already had Trump break the uh, JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal during his administration, and Biden breaking this agreement so soon after it was signed, or not signed, but just kind of put together and agreed to, uh, really, I, I would guess, in Tehran is huge red flags, and there's probably just going to be no more talk with the Americans after this. But hopefully I'm wrong on that, but I'm, I'm really concerned that this will be the end of U.S.-Iranian diplomacy for the next decade or so. All right, everybody, that's the end for the show today. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back with more later in the week. And remember, subscribe somewhere because we're likely going to have a bonus episode.